Welcome to COIQ, a first of its kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back, COIQ listeners. On today's show, we have Robbie Cape with us and Brad Youngren, the two two of the minds behind 98.6. And I am really excited about this episode. They are doing some incredible things and I will let them tell you a little bit more about it, but welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's, It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. I think that you guys are doing something really amazing because you have, instead of leading with a technology, um, you are leading with a problem that you were solving that's just being enabled by technology. And I think that that's just brilliant. And you're addressing a, a big challenge that we have in the marketplace of primary care access. So I I can't wait to have this conversation with you today. So just to get us started, just in case our listeners don't know who you are, Robbie, tell us a little bit about you and your background. So I'm I'm originally Canadian, as it turns out. I grew up in a single-payer system, um, and uh, I ended up going to school in the United States. I went to school in New Jersey. Uh, Right after graduation, I came out here to the Pacific Northwest, to work for Microsoft. I thought I'd work for Microsoft for three years and then start my own business. But my three-year plan turned into 12 years at Microsoft and just amazing learning and a lot of fun. Uh Uh, Finally, in 2005, I left Microsoft and founded a company called Cozy that's in the business of helping families manage the day-to-day chaos of family life. Uh, Sold that to Time Warner in 2014. And then in 2015, I uh, got together with my co-founder here at 98.6 and began this new adventure. Uh, and the rest is the history of 98.6, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And what about you, Brad? Tell us a little bit about your background as well. So I'm an emergency physician by background. I went to the military medical school, uh, primarily interested in disaster and humanitarian medicine. I found myself uh, deeply involved at uh, evaluating how medical devices could scale on the battlefield, became very interested in in the field of digital healthcare and how that could impact saving lives. After getting out of the army, after a number of involuntary vacation opportunities, uh, I sort of moved into the digital healthcare space um, and have been, uh, never really looked back. I've been involved in a number of device companies as chief medical officer, most recently a company called Q Health down in La Jolla. Uh, my first company was a, one called Movasante, which was the first FDA-approved medical device in the country. It was an ultrasound uh, probe plugged into a Windows phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, we built the predicate systems for uh, medical devices with smartphone technology. And uh, so I've been with 98.6 since the beginning of January 2017, helped uh, build the clinic and get us ready to see our first patient in February of that same year. And uh, have been ever since, and I'm excited to be on the show. That's great. Thank you. So, so let's just kind of level set here. Where are you in the commercialization process? Do you have paying customers now or are you still in the launch process? Well, we're, we're very much in the commercialization, uh, like deep, deep into the process. We launched commercially in January of 2017. Okay. Uh, you know, when we came into 2017, we didn't have a single paying uh, corporation on the platform. Uh, we now have uh, over 70 uh, paying corporations on the platform. Uh, as it turns out, close to 25% of those very large companies, are, these are companies with typically over 2,000 employees, over mm-hmm. 25% of them are actually in the healthcare business, which is something we're super proud of. Uh, so it's been, it's been wonderful to see uh, healthcare companies be very, very early movers in offering 98.6 to their employees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what was it like getting your first customers? You know, it's, it's always hard uh, to win your first customer uh, when you're a startup. You know, we, we have this saying here, which is that everyone wants to be first to be second. 
Uh, and it's just, it is just a fact of life. Um, I don't think it only goes to, um, you know, commercial endeavors. I think there's a lot of people out there in life in general who like to be first to be second. It takes a certain amount of, um, of sort of adventure seeking to want to be one of the first adopters um, of a new platform. As it turns out, uh, our first customer, we were very fortunate, and this is typically what happens when you're, when you're getting out the gate. Um, our first customer was actually uh, one of our investors. Uh, it was an investor who had uh, a company with a few hundred employees, uh, and he was kind enough. Um, and, you know, I think I'd even go so far as to say that, you know, he might not have been a customer of ours if not for the fact that he was an investor, but it gave us the ability to develop the experience mm -hmm. uh, of a deployment. And, you know, you, you, you need a first deployment because you need an opportunity to relentlessly improve and get the, um, you know, get the experience right for both of the, both the employer and for the patients who are ultimately going to be taking advantage of the service. So it was a great, great experience. And, you know, just uh, less than a year and a half later, you know, we've got over 70 of them. That's great. Yeah. Um, that's, that is such a huge hurdle, just getting that first paying customer. A lot of the innovators that I talk to, you know, talk about it with chicken or the egg, right? No, nope. it's really hard to find the people that want to be the first, <laughs> especially yeah. in healthcare and a very risk averse industry. Yeah, we, we actually implemented a pretty cool um, concept uh, very early on. So a commercial leader was one of our first employees. Um, our seventh full-time employee was a commercial leader uh, for the organization. And this is a good solid two and a half years before we were even ready to commercialize. So this is back in, in 2015. Uh, you know, we brought this individual on board. Uh, his name was Stephen Hurwitz. And he put together this early development partner program where we had uh, about 15 employers in the Seattle area who all helped us build the product and gave us feedback very early on um, on the features that we were building and the types of deployments that we would do. Now, there was no commitment. They were just sitting around the table and giving us feedback. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the first year of deployments, um, almost 80% of those early development partners ended up deciding to deploy the product to their employees. Uh, wow. So, you know, I'd say that that program was very effective in helping us getting uh, many of those early deployments. So I just, I, I think that that is just brilliant and it's so contradictory to what I hear in the marketplace. So I, I do a lot of educating around um, the fact that launching an innovation and commercializing an innovation is two very different processes and that launch is part of commercialization, but commercialization starts way earlier than launch and it continues way after launch and not a lot of innovators get that. So what motivated you to invest in someone that was a commercial leader so early in the process? How did you identify that need? Uh, that's, you know, that's a, a, a really good question. And it turns out that, um, that there's a lot of things that we're doing uh, here at 98.6 that are, very unconventional, um, un, un, you know, unusual. And I think that it's largely due to the fact, and, you know, Brad can, can talk about this from his experience, that we've put together an executive team that is uh, literally every single one of the executives on this team is, uh, is covered with scar tissue. Uh, you know, they've, they... Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in the case of Brad, you know, Brad actually has some war wounds. Um, for the rest of us, Literally. our wounds are, are, <laughs> are a little bit more virtual. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but it's incredible what 20 years of experience mm -hmm. will bring to the methodologies that you employ to launch a business. Um, you know, one of the very early things that we decided to do, and I'd say that this was a result of 
of my co-founder and I and the first few executives who we hired, really having been through this experience of, of working at companies that had singular muscles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, know you, you look at companies and typically, you know, a company will have a technology muscle and that'll be very clear that that's their main muscle. Sometimes you'll meet companies and I'm sure, you know, Brad has seen companies that really had a really strong medical muscle and mm-hmm. that was at their core, you know, medical or research. But, you know, this is very common to create businesses with singular muscles. Uh, you know, you want to be focused and you want to be strong and you want to be good. And we recognized uh, in, in the business that we were entering that we were going to have to build a company that had four muscles and that we were going to have to develop those muscles from the very, very beginning. Um, one of the muscles is technology. It's true. But one of the muscles is also medical. You know, it's a major muscle for our company. One of the muscles that we developed very early on, like literally our, our uh, fourth or fifth full-time hire uh, was on the regulatory and compliance front. We hired a full-time attorney who had a specialty in healthcare related law uh, to build our, our regulatory and compliance muscle. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, we made the decision that for us to build a successful, scalable business that we needed to have a commercial muscle. We needed to be deeply integrated with the people who would eventually be our customers, mm-hmm. um, who would eventually be uh, the people who would pay for the service. Um, and that turned out to be self-insured employers. And so our seventh full-time hire was someone who would focus all of their time developing those relationships. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> So that is so true. And it's so challenging. I, I just, it, it's so challenging for health innovators because as you know, in the beginning, resources are, are slim. And, and so that is, um, it's, it's not expensive. I mean, it's not cheap to hire for those, for those muscles, right? It, it, it costs some money. It's, it's, it's basically, you know, a big bet and a big investment that you're making into the future of the company. There's one other layer to it, which is probably worth highlighting is uh, early on when I started talking to Ravi about coming on at 90.6 as chief medical officer, seeing the conversations around the development of the four muscles. And additionally, this notion that over half of the technologists in the company were going to be focused on the physician facing side of the technology. That investment in the physician technology was something I had not seen in the market Mm -hmm. and really helpful in terms of hiring and building our physician medical culture. Uh, having a deep interwoven relationship between the software engineers, product development team, and the medical team has been incredibly valuable for us to scale as fast as we've been able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you, we're kind of on the fringes about um, product co-creation. And it sounds like that's really fundamental to part of your business. And, and so let's just talk about, um, you know, that co-creation process for you. Um, how did you include them and who did you include? Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I could talk about the physician side for sure. Um, I think that what we're doing with our uh, physician group that we call the core clinicians is unique in the market and sort of answers at least part of your question uh, mm-hmm. perfectly. So our physicians to really deliver the high quality care that we wanted to at 98.6 across the country, across 51 licensed boundaries, um, we decided that we were going to take a very different approach to delivering physician uh, care on the platform. So as opposed to most technology platforms that hire locum tenens or part-time physicians to operate on the platform, almost independent of the rest of the organization, we took a completely different approach. We hired our clinicians full-time at 98.6 so that they would be deeply invested in the corporate culture that we were building with our core values and to make Mm -hmm. sure they were fundamentally aligned with us in our mission. And then uh, on top of that, all of our physicians have a percentage of time, about 20% uh, dedicated for non-clinical activities. So that frees them up to impact on multiple dimensions across the entire company which on the physician side is a a big pleaser. They like to feel like they can be part of the product development, Mm -hmm. uh, recruiting, UX research and design, really any domain you could think of within the context of the company. And that helps uh, also the technologists get perspective, a physician perspective very fast. 
when we have a question about what would physicians think about something, we ask our own internal physicians, which now uh, is over north of 25 in-house physicians who are full-time uh, that help us develop the product every day. And, and, so, go ahead. and that, that same sort of integration happens uh, across all of the muscles. Mm -hmm. So when, whenever we're, we're building a new capability in the product, I think our, our launch of pediatrics uh, earlier this year is, is a great, great testimony to this sort of interweaving um, of the muscles across the company. We, we literally had to have every, you know, senior people um, from every single muscle in the room as we were defining our rollout of pediatrics. Like obviously there were deep, deep considerations on the medical front, but there were also incredibly complex uh, issues uh, to be grappled with on the regulatory and compliance front. The way you treat pediatrics and the way you flow information related to pediatric visits uh, is different in every one of the 51 jurisdictions that we're in. In every 50 state in DC, the rules are different. Um, and so those considerations had to get woven in. Uh, there were different considerations for each of our commercial customers related to how they considered pediatrics as part of their membership and how they define those people. And obviously there was deep, deep consideration on the uh, technology front around how we were gonna build the solution and build out the capabilities uh, that were gonna make the experience comfortable uh, for you know, a, a two-year-old or a five-year-old or even a 15 or 16-year-old, all of whom are, are pediatric patients and yet clearly all of whom had very, very different capabilities when it comes to interacting with technology. Yeah, I remember when my three-year-old niece was showing me how to use the iPad. <laughs> they're, they're pretty darn advanced, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. yep. So, you know, how impactful would you say that getting physician input early in that ideation process, how do you think that that's been impactful or how do you think that shaped who 98.6 is today? I think it's part, part of the core of what makes us different than anyone else you could find in the market. Um, mm -hmm. Just fundamentally, um, it, it has really created a culture where physicians are very excited to come work for us. We have a very large pipeline now, we're fortunate in that, in that regard. Um, and uh, so that's great to see where that the company is really on a mission to really uh, deliver uh, primary care so that no one has to make a financial trade off to get primary care mm -hmm. in the United States, essentially globally. But there's also another mission, which is sort of saving primary care. It's in a crisis. Yep. The physician community is feeling this deeply. And uh, as physicians come across our company and discover the focus and intention we have around physician quality of life, physician culture. Um, it just bleeds across the entire company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, I mean, it just, it seems like that would trickle down to um, like employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction, you know, with the experience and employee satisfaction, both with the culture and their ability to have impact as well as just their experience coming to work every day or staying where they are at work today, every day. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it absolutely does. You know, we have a saying, actually, it was lent to us by one of our board members, which is that culture is not the most important thing. It's the only thing. Uh, and our mission uh, that, that Brad articulated uh, is absolutely central to that culture that we've created. We're a, we're a mission-driven uh, company. Like, yes, we, we are, uh, you know, building a, a profitable, uh, commercially exciting uh, corporation. Yes, that is important. And we happen to also believe that by virtue of the work that we're doing, we can make the world a better place um, and ensure that every human on this earth has access to high quality primary care without ever needing to make a financial trade-off to get it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I'm, I'm starting to, so there's a conversation that I have um, on a regular basis and it's this idea of why some innovations fail and why do some succeed? So before I kind of go there, what, what's your perspective on why some succeed and why some fail? Uh, you know, it, I, I say every single situation is, is different. Um, I think that, that likely most entrepreneurs feel, uh, at least the stories that I hear as I talk to entrepreneurs in the market, uh, is, that, is that most opportunities fail because they, um, they don't end up with enough capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, capital is this, uh, for most CEOs, uh, capital is the, 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 the resource that constrains them most dramatically uh, and al- ultimately the thing that they run out of. Um, so I, I think that's most, most clear, it's most salient, although I don't actually think that money is the issue. Um, mm-hmm. I think money um, ends up being a proxy for time. Uh, I think time is the scarcest resource mm-hmm. that, uh, that startups have. Um, I think it's not only the amount of time that it takes to build something and prove that it can be successful. Um, but it's also the amount of time that you spend building something to prove that it can't be successful. Uh, you know, it, 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 it turns out fast, right? <laughs> that, that's exactly right. You know, uh, you know, they, they don't teach you if, if, if there was, um, you know, startup entrepreneur school, like if such a school existed and it doesn't exist um, and there's no great single book to, you know, that uh, on the topic, my bet is that there would be a bunch of talk about tenacity Mm -hmm. and continuing to push hard and push through object, you know, objections and keep trying and pivot and try again and then pivot and try again. And, and so there's a lot of talk about that, but it turns out that there's not nearly as much talk about how to fail. Right. And in fact, failing is way more important in some ways than succeeding. I mean, failing happens, you know, people say it's 99%. I think that that number is way, way too low. I think it's more like 99.9 or 99.99% of the time you know, people fail and yet there's no learning about how to fail. And I, so, you know, uh, I think one of the most important things that, that entrepreneurs can do is even in those first six, 12, 18, 24 months, independent of whether or not they have access to a lot of money. Like in some ways, access to a lot of money can be the worst thing that happens right. to them because it exactly. enables them to take too much time, right? Yeah. When, really need to do is, and some investors are really good at putting these, these milestones in place. And if you don't meet that six month milestone and you don't meet, or you don't meet the 12 month milestone, you know, know that it's done. Right. Now right. the way you define those milestones is incredibly important, right? Set mm-hmm. mm-hmm. your milestone around consumer adoption and you're in a consumer space and you know that it takes a year or a year and a half to start getting consumer adoption, that's probably an unrealistic milestone to set. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so I, I, th- I think that that is just incredible wisdom for our audience to, list, to, to heed. Majority of our listeners or innovators that are in the trenches today and and there is a big um, fear of failure, and right? Society does not embrace that enough, um, especially in the entrepreneurial market. And I come across people that get access to millions of dollars and they pour it all into the product. They don't always do what you did, which they're not always including stakeholders in the product development, the co-creation process. And I, I've talked to someone not that long ago, they were three years in, like 5 million into the product and they hadn't even gone to market yet. They were, cause it wasn't ready yet. <laughs> and, and so somebody needed to take that money from them away, take that away a long time ago. 
<laughs> yep, it's true. It's true. So, so there's, there's another thing that really stands out to me that I think that you guys do extremely well, and it's storytelling. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about storytelling and how... How do you feel, how do you think that storytelling fits into your commercialization process? And what was your purpose and intention behind building out such an incredible story? I think our storytelling is likely more related to the brand and the trust um, and our position in the market then, I mean, obviously all of that is incredible, is directly related and feeds into commercialization. Um, but it really started with the, the need to make decisions around what we were going to stand for mm -hmm. as, as a product. Like, like, yeah, it's true. We're delivering primary care. Um, and people get sick and they come to us and we diagnose and treat them. And yes, we can look at it at that level. But what we wanted to do was really stand back and, um, and think about our role in this incredibly interesting, uh, this complicated um, and, uh, uh, and, and sort of rich with history ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's easy to to stand and throw darts, you know, at the healthcare ecosystem in the United States. And I know there's a lot of people who like to spend most of their pastime throwing those darts. But we wanted to take a position in that ecosystem, which meant that we were going to become part of that problem. You could say. Um, and we wanted to define what our role would be within that ecosystem. An ecosystem that I happen to believe is actually pretty incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, look at the work that Brad has done, you know, uh, in, in his time before he came to 98.6. You know, you look at you know, the innovation, whether it's innovation that happened on the battlefield, um, or the innovation that that he was a part of around microfluidics, um, or any of the other amazing innovations that are happening. Some of them are happening at health systems and it, um, you know, and in laboratories. I mean, it's an amazing ecosystem. Yes, there are problems, but our narrative, our story was about beginning to lay out how we wanted to take some degree of responsibility in mm -hmm. this incredible ecosystem and the impact that we wanted to have. That's, mm -hmm. that, that was really the purpose for the storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think sometimes health innovators really with struggle with trying to figure out what's their clear and distinct value proposition, right? Um, I hear from investors quite often of them being pitched by innovators to raise that capital that you were talking about. And, 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 I, and I sat them sat with these folks for 45 minutes or an hour, and I still don't really know what they do. <laughs> and, 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 and I think it's even more complicated when you're talking about a breakthrough innovation um, because it's it's radically different. No one's really set the groundwork, right? So what what does on demand um, primary care mean? You know, and you've got to kind of create a story to communicate that and what it means. And and so I think that you guys have done a really good job and, and a real good example for our listeners to um, kind of heed some of that um, storytelling that you've done. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of work. You know, when you see that single value proposition, you think that it's, oh, it's just one sentence. You just, you know, take a few minutes, 20 minutes and just knock that out. And I it's, 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 it's it not easy. right. Right. Yeah. Right. It's um, so, you know, when it came to the messaging, you know, tied to the storytelling, you know, what were some of the things that you struggled with? Cause again, our audience is, is, kind of doing this right now, trying to figure out what their value proposition. So how did you go through that process to end where you are today? Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yes. Yeah, just on the, on the physician side, I think we've done a lot of work around understanding how to exist within the ecosystem. I mean, there's tons mm -hmm. of 
very passionate people in healthcare who are trying to do the right thing. Some yep. of the infrastructure is in place for them to make the impact they would like. Um, our approach is to come into that space and find those advocates, find how we can align and support their visions, look at as partners in solving problems, not necessarily even as disruptors to, to the existing ecosystem. Yep. And that allows us to sit alongside the existing primary care community instead of looking as a, like a threat to the primary care community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Brad is raising uh, the, the element that was by far and away the most complicated part of building our narrative. Uh, it, it, it was thinking about all of our constituents. It turns out we have a lot of constituents. <laughs> we have uh, some of these constituents. Well, actually, all, all of them are people who we want to ultimately serve. You know, yep. in fact, here at 90.6, we, we try to avoid using the word customer mm-hmm. because I never want us to be sitting around a table and debating about who our customer is. It turns out they're all our customers. Right. The, the patients are our customers. The self-insured employers are our customers. The health plans uh, are absolutely our customers. Uh, we, we are hopeful that the health systems with the physicians who ultimately carry those health systems day in and day out are, are our customers. You know, we're learning that there are other elements of the ecosystem that people often don't even talk about, you know, like the pharmacy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like all of these people are our are, um, constituents who we believe that we can serve. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we didn't think about the physicians who we were hiring as people who we serve, but that, that was actually, that, that was a mistake. We should have. Now, it turns out our narrative worked really well um, in that context, but the truth of the matter is our constituents include every single person who we hire. It includes every physician who we're trying to recruit. So the hardest thing for us was building a narrative that would be compelling to every single one of these constituents. That's really, really hard in this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and unfortunately, if you're, if you're building a narrative uh, that is compelling, the chances are that it's going to upset someone right? That someone is going to be turned off by that narrative or think that you have hubris, you know, representing the narrative in, in, in that voice. Um, And so we were really careful uh, and um, ultimately had to come, come through with something that we not only believed in deeply, you know, in our soul, but also was a narrative that we felt would be um, embracing of all of these different constituents. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's so right, because a lot of people ask me, you know, why is it so complex? Why is it so difficult to commercialize an innovation in healthcare compared to other industries? And being a multi-sided market that you just described absolutely aids in that complexity and that difficulty. Because like you just described, the, the, the user is not necessarily the buyer, <laughs> right? Um, it's not necessarily the prescriber. I mean, it's just, it's, it, healthcare is just such a complicated ecosystem and buying process. And, and, and I find that sometimes stakeholder groups or constituents can be eliminated, it, it, forgotten when, when we're going through that messaging process, um, right. or they can be just muddled and tangled and, and we, or we're just, we're, we're always like, we're really excited about the patients and how we're going to change their lives and make their make this world a better place that we forget, you know, a lot of the value proposition to the B2B stakeholder. So that's just so, so true. So you kind of touched on this a little bit. So I want to talk now about like, what are some of the things, the decisions, and, and we touched on it, but what are some of the decisions that you think that the, I didn't know it then, but when I made this decision, it, it was really, really influential in the success that we're experiencing today. So uh, I'm going to sort of set Brad up here a little bit because I'd, I'd like him to answer this question. 
uh, with a, a little bit of, of backdrop. Yep. Um, when, when we hired Brad, uh, it's fair to say that, well, I, I certainly had no, I, I had no more than a year of experience uh, with healthcare. Um, and I certainly personally, um, you know, and, and a bunch of the people who I had, uh, you know, on the executive team, even at that point, had no experience um, actually building a clinic. <laughs> and so, you know, when, when, when Brad came on board uh, and we were just incredibly fortunate to be introduced to him um, and, uh, you know, our conversations spanned several months, you know, before Brad was uh, ready to, to, to join us, um, you know, I gave Brad and his peers all gave Brad an enormous um, amount of room to to build the clinic of the future, you know, to to build uh, a clinical operation that likely physicians only dream about and and but unfortunately, you know, never really have a chance to dream about. And there were a lot of decisions, and, I, and Brad will talk to you about a couple of them uh, that Brad made early on that weren't, they weren't part of, they couldn't have been part of our plan at the beginning because we had no business making a plan around those issues because we no, had no history. Yep. Uh, but, but, but what we knew was that we had to have incredible talent at the table uh, to help us make some of these decisions. So Brad, maybe you can talk about some of those critical first decisions you made around building the clinic that have ended up just being core to, uh, to how we operate. Sure. Thanks, Robbie. I think um, to Robbie's credit, uh, he gave me a lot of space the first few months to really dive into one of our core values of critical and informed thinking and unconstrained thinking around um, what could we do to really build this clinic of our dreams that he uh, mm -hmm. asked, asked us to build. And there were a couple dimensions to that, which were um, even new for me. I'd built clinics in the past, but obviously nothing on the scale, nothing that demanded this sort of to build an on-demand primary care service that crossed state boundaries, ultimately provided 24-7 care to adults and kids was a fairly heavy lift. Mm -hmm. uh, when I looked in the market, I just felt that the most important thing to fall back on was quality, that if we could build a quality physician service, a medical service that um, was consistent with the brand um, that ultimately that that over time would um, really allow us to come into the market and have health systems uh, and employers as well really appreciate the work we're doing. And so that we had to start from the beginning with that fundamental approach. So um, I went to Robbie and I said, after a few months of mulling this over and saying, you know, I think we need to uh, license our physicians across the country. Um, I haven't seen any company that's done that yet. So, but we're gonna have to be the first. It's gonna cost a fair amount of money. Uh, doctor, <laughs> gold, smile, gold. Smile. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I know I just got a couple months ago, but now I need a, a lot of money to do this. <laughs> and, um, and, but I think it'll ultimately give us what we want, which is instead of being a company that's out in the market saying we have five, three, four, four thousand doctors in the market that service our clients that, uh, we have a smaller number of core clinicians who deliver the care every day. When you when you come in at 98.6, you know exactly the kind of care you're getting because you can look on our website and see exactly who our physicians are that work for 98.6. Mm -hmm. So we started that process, um, and I had never worked in a company that had a, um, a core value set that was so um, lived, believed, and discussed on a daily basis. I'd never experienced that personally. Uh, and I think a lot of physicians in healthcare have never seen that. So to impart that kind of culture onto the physicians who were coming on was incredibly exciting. Everyone was uh, really on board with that. And we started licensing those clinicians across the country. And we've continued with that strategy uh, since the beginning to this day. Um, and that's still uh, how we're approaching our physician hiring. That, uh, you know, as long as we continue to hire our physicians as full time uh, and, you know, so and put them through the same rigorous tests that the other uh, members of the company have. So one of the things that's probably worth highlighting is I, I didn't want the physicians to be looked at any differently here for the, 
for the easy and for the hard. So they mm -hmm. go through the same interview process that a software engineer goes through, the same interview loop. They don't, uh, and there's no shortcuts. And I think, uh, you know, we only hire one out of every maybe 20 applicants, but the ones we hire are uh, of the quality that can really represent the brand 24-7, 365. Are you guys very intentional about the, the training and development that goes along with them to be able to live out those values, um, you know, without being under your roof? Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, we, the clinicians have their own private communication channels to discuss the core values and how, how those are impacting the work they're doing. Um, they're discussed by everyone in the company on a day-to-day -day basis. They're called out in meetings, uh, in group meetings, in one-on-ones uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, which is really exciting, unique, and the physicians are uh, engaged in that same type of behavior. So there, um, we have really spent a lot of time as we've hired some clinicians who are not in Seattle for a variety of reasons, um, that they really have to be as deeply engaged in the company as everyone else. So they're in the mm -hmm. office a lot mm -hmm. uh, because we want them interwoven in the same way. And sort of the ultimate charge to the team was, but I want the clinician in Florida to feel as deeply connected to Robbie Cape as the physician who lives in Seattle. And I think we've accomplished that. <laughs> yes. That's great. And, and I, I, you know, it, it is, it is so deeply impactful. We're, and it's one of the reasons why we've been so successful at recruiting some of the best primary care physicians in the nation uh, to 98.6, you know, this, this point that, that, that Brad made around every one of our employees being one of, of our physicians being 100% dedicated to 98.6 and being, uh, being, being a permanent employee of the company. That is part of it. The other part of it is everything he talked about around the way that we treat them at the company. You know, a lot of, a, a lot of physicians, I, I hear this, I've, I'm not a physician, I've never been a physician. But I, I hear from physicians we hire that they're, they're used to working in this environment where they're, they're almost lone wolves. Even, even if they're part of a huge system, mm -hmm. it's still like they're alone in the room. Yes, they have a patient there, but the patient is the person they're serving. They, they operate very alone uh, the vast majority of the time. Whereas here, even when a patient uh, is in that, um, that chat with a single physician, that physician feels like they are part of a very large team. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just because of the software that they're using. Um, it's because, you know, when, when they get off that shift, they're probably going to be jumping into meetings with, you know, five or six or seven people across the company talking about some future innovation that we're going to build into the product that's going to make a difference for our patients or for them in their physician experience. And that team dynamic is incredibly powerful. Uh, and it ends up accruing all these other values, uh, you know, just, just as a matter of nature. It's, it's really just, it's, it's really magic. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it. And, you know, it, to me, it kind of goes back to looking at the physicians as a separate audience segment, understanding the problems and needs that they have, and then being able to deliver a strong value proposition to them, just like you would paying customers. That's and right. So, yeah. That's how to add. Just, just like we do uh, for the software engineers who, um, you know, who we're, we're out there trying to recruit. And just like we do for the marketers um, or the communications people. I mean, you know, we, we have to build as a, as a company, as a growing company that's out there uh, competing for talent uh, in an aggressive marketplace. We, we think very carefully about the value that we're delivering mm -hmm. to every single person who has a role to play on this team. Um, and the physicians are, are no different. And it sounds like you had that mindset early on, which, you know, in, in the conversations that I have with a lot of health innovators, they think about vision, mission, values, culture, um, you know, employee engagement down the road. Right now, it's about raising money and building the technology. 
and and I think that some of the some of them kind of miss out on the benefits of putting all of those other things in place earlier on in that process. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, I I happen, uh, you know, personally, I'm incredibly fortunate um, in in that you know we have uh, I, I have a co-founder who uh, is able to spend uh, the majority uh, of his time focused on fundraising, which has allowed me, uh, you know, in my position as the CEO. Uh, with the executives on the team to focus almost all of our time on building the company. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other thing that was important to us from the very early days, and again, I'd say that this was um, related to advice that we got not only from my co-founder, but also from the other people who we were seeking advice from, who were some of the most phenomenal business leaders uh, in the world, we, we decided early on that we had to build the company for scale. From day one, we knew, or we, actually we couldn't have known. We imagined that um, the value proposition that we were creating was going to be incredibly compelling um, and that people were going to want to adopt it quickly um, and that we wanted to be in a position to deliver. So we were going to have to grow the company quickly. Um, in order to do so, we, we needed to build a very solid foundation. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, you're building a skyscraper and you want to be digging, you know, your foundation deep, deep in the ground because it's got to carry uh, this incredible building that you're going to build up on top of it. And so we literally thought from day one about building the infrastructure that would support a business that we imagined could be incredibly impactful in the industry. So things like uh, the core values that we set, we set those very, very early. Mm -hmm. The muscles that we set, we set them very, very early. The key executives who we hired, uh, you know, we brought those people on very, very early, all to support the growth that we were hoping would, would happen. We couldn't know, uh, mm -hmm. but we knew that if we executed, it would happen. Yeah. So, so I think that you've, you know, as, as we've had this conversation today, you've shared a lot of your personal experience and that that's been really invaluable for the listeners. The last question I have for you, is there anything else, any other advice that you would want to give to those other health innovators that are out there in the trenches right now? Yeah, it's, from my perspective, um, I would just keep keep motivated and on a on a task that you believe can actually change healthcare, and keep driving forward with that. And don't be lulled by the traditional sales cycles that hospitals may have, because there's other many other opportunities to drive your idea, your business, your company forward uh, more than on an annual sales cycle. And we'll have to have a whole nother episode to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bobby, what do you have to say? You know, it's, it's, almost, it's almost the same point that Brad made and maybe just said slightly differently. Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's about fail fast, but even at the micro level, which means you need to take what you're building or what you're thinking you want to build out there as quickly as possible. Certainly it shouldn't take you more than a month or two months to go out there and begin gathering feedback from the market that you're ultimately gonna to wanna to sell to on whatever it is that you're planning on building. You know, if it's consumer business, you should be able to stand it up in a month or a month and a half. Absolutely, you should. It might not be everything that you want it to be, but you need to start that cycle of failing and relentless improvement and failing and relentless improvement. I mean, that is, you know, it's all about failure. You know, you said no one wants to fail. If you don't want to fail, you shouldn't start a company. It's all. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Words of wisdom. About, You've heard it right here. <laughs> okay. 
if you, you got to fail, you got to learn, you got to change, you got to grow. And the sooner you can get that cycle going, the better. If, if it is a, a, um, an enterprise sale that you need to do and you're thinking, oh my God, it's going to take me a year and a half or two years to build up a product that I can actually sell to the enterprise. I don't agree. Build a prototype. Even if it's, even if you build it with a Sharpie and a piece of copy paper, yep. build a prototype and then go sit down in front of the people who you'll ultimately sell that product to and get their feedback. Let them tell you that your baby is ugly. Absolutely. You actually want to hear it because that's what's going to get you to go back and relentlessly improve. That's what it's all about. Yeah, sometimes I think that innovators are afraid to ask those constituents what they think because they might not think like they think and they really want to build what they want to build and they almost don't care what the audience wants. <laughs> I know what you need. Let me give it to you. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we all know how that story ends. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> those are the ones just maybe that aren't failing fast they're taking a whole lot of time and people and money down with them in that failing process <laughs> that's right but uh, i mean ultimately ultimately those people like yes there might be a one in a million of them and everyone likes to focus on the one in a million that ended up just building what they wanted and didn't ask anyone and they ended up succeeding it's very easy to focus on that one in a million yeah, so yeah. What, one in a million doesn't happen. Right, like, right. That's not how the vast majority of successes occur. Sure. You know, successes happening happen by building what the customer wants. And the only way you know what the customer wants is by sitting in front of them and asking them. Absolutely. Well, I think that that was a great way to end this episode. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I hope everybody that's listening is taking notes because there's just a wealth of wisdom that's peppered in throughout this series. And um, so I'm just going to ask you as our closing question, how can people get a hold of you if they want to find out more about 98.6 and what you're doing? What's the best way for people to reach you? So there's, there's two things that I'd love for for every listener to do. First of all, go to the App Store uh, and download 98.6 and try the product um, and send us feedback. I mean, it's $20 for the first year for unlimited access to primary care. So even on your first visit, the, the app will have paid for itself um, and you can use it another 10 times, you know, for the remainder of the year, and it's not going to cost you a single penny. Uh, but most of all, send us feedback. So that's the first thing that we'd love for you to do. And the second thing, you know, if, if you, um, you know, if you directly or indirectly uh, know of people who lead benefits organizations uh, and who are delivering benefits to their employees, please have them go to 98.6.com and learn about our offering for employers, learn about our offering for health plans, um, and then send us a contact us note because we'd love to talk to you about how we can bring the value of 98.6 uh, to those people who depend on you. Well, that's awesome. I'm a raving fan and I will help okay. you promote this company as best as I possibly can. Okay, I know thank you so much. Thank know. you, okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product. Few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.